Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this evening. We want to thank you for your blood that you shed for us. And by accepting you into our hearts as our personal Savior, by realizing that you shed your blood, you gave your life, you died for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And if we believe that and trust in that, Lord, you said faithful and just are you and that you will give us a home in heaven. And we want to thank you. Thank you for that. We praise you for this hour, and we praise you for this time we have together. And we want to pray for our pastor and Melva as you give them a safe return uh, as they come back. And, Lord, watch over them now. Bless them. And, Lord, we want to thank you for this ministry and all it stands for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My message this evening is love thy neighbor. My theme is... Loving others through God's eyes. Loving others through God's eyes. I want us to try to see others tonight as God sees others. You know, man looks on the outward appearance, the Bible says, but God looks on the... The what? Yes, the heart, the, the very core of man. That's where God looks. Because out of the heart pours, I heard it. <laughs> Help me out here, I'm trying to get you involved in this. This is an involvement message, folks. Run with me here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We base love sometime, well, we base love as human beings many times on sight. We make judgment calls on sight. We make rash decisions by sight. Face it, <clears throat> we're human. We see a situation, we see a person, we see something in its and, and within a split second, we've already made a decision and based our opinion on that decision about a person or about a situation. And that's, that's just what, it's human nature. But God doesn't do that. God does not see man in sight as we see man. Our first impressions our sight impressions, even before we get to know someone. And you know what I'm talking about. You're walking down the street, and, and you're walking along, or you're driving along, or whatever may be the situation, and you look and you see a person you've never seen before, and you base <clears throat> that person on a judgment call that you've made. You've already, you've already put this person in a category just by looking at them and, and, and already have judged them just by sight. And I, 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 I do that myself. I'm human. I'm only, I am only a sinner, and you are only a sinner, saved by grace. grace. Because that, that's another thing. God, God looks at love differently. And God looks at love through mercy and grace. So three things God uses to base his, his love, or two things, are mercy and grace to base his love, you see. <clears throat> I want us to look at, just to get a picture, let's look at the description of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now let's look at, this is the description of love. Go to 1 Corinthians, keep your place in Romans, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you know what this passage of scripture is. This is the love, the love passage. Everywhere you see and every time you hear the word charity, that means love. We had to memorize this passage of scripture in college and uh, 
was what it was a blessing. I can do most of it now, but not all of it. It's been some 20 years or better. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, doth not, doth not seek a, excuse me, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Now listen, this is just the character, the description of love, my friends. This is God we're talking about here. As we're reading this, this is God. This is God's penned word and a description of how he sees love. Amen. <clears throat> Doth not be say, behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Imagine that. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For, no, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I know, I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is charity. Out of all of this, faith, hope, and charity, the greatest of these is charity or love. For we, verse 12, for we now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, or we see ourselves, you look at yourself in a mirror, and you're face to face with yourself, and the only one you have in front of you is you. Who are you when you look at you? That's what the passage is saying in that particular piece of scripture. You're looking at yourself and questioning yourself and then say, the greatest part about yourself is love. <clears throat> now, I'm not talking about gushy, mushy, feely, good kind of love. I'm talking about a genuine love for individuals, a genuine love for souls, a genuine love for people. For God, so what? Love. Loved. <laughs> One of the greatest passages in Scripture and it says, for God so loved. We saw a description. Now let's look at love demonstrated. Go with me to Luke chapter 10. We saw the description of love. Now let's see this love demonstrated. Luke chapter 10, verse 29. I think I'm in the right spot. Verse 30. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now this is a, a priest or a man of God here in the scriptures, okay? Somebody that should have a heart for an individual, right? You would think, okay? 
And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now, this was a, a man of learn, learning, a man of the law, a man that knows the scriptures, a man that teaches the law of the scriptures. Well, he should have had some sort of heart, I would think. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, whatsoever thou spend, spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? The question, and the answer is the Samaritan. Now, as we look at this passage of scripture, the person that fell in the Samaritan's eyes was a dog. In a sense, because they were of different backgrounds, different teachings, they wouldn't even cross the road beside each other. But this person saw this other person wounded and had compassion on him and went above and beyond his duty and paid the innkeeper bound him in oil and wine. Now, back then, oil and wine was a medicine. It wasn't actual wine, and the oil was medicinal oil. Bound him up, took care of him, placed him on his mule, and took him to an inn and paid for a room for him. You know, Motel 6, they'll leave the light on. <laughs> the light was on, the guy pulled in with his mule, parked it, paid the token, and went in and took the guy in. But anyway... The one you would not have thought would have had compassion on this man had the most compassion on him. Yeah. And what is Jesus saying? You, gotta, you have to start looking at individuals, and he's telling his disciples, you need to start, because he's teaching here. These words are in red, meaning Jesus is speaking. So when, he, when Jesus is speaking in the Gospels, then he's teaching. So he's teaching here that you have to have compassion. You have to go out and go the extra mile. Go back to the book of Romans. <clears throat> Chapter 8 again. Number one, to see others we must awake out of sleep. Verse 11. Chapter 8. Oh, 13. Well, no wonder it didn't look right. Thank you very much. I'm looking at that and thinking, boy, that doesn't look right. Verse 11. And, and that knowing the time, that now is the high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. Sometimes we, walk to our, we are walking around in a slumber, in a sleep. Our eyes are glazed over. And the Bible says, the Bible says, hey, it's high time to wake out of sleep. Wake up and see who's around you. Take a good look at who, is, who you're passing by. Take a good look at what's going on around you. Take advantage of the situation. Awake out of sleep. Friends, what are we doing for Christ? What are we doing for Jesus? Awake out of sleep. You know, he's coming soon. His return is imminent. That's right. And what are we doing? I praise the Lord that here a few weeks ago, we, my sister-in-law's father-in-law 
is in a hospital down here in Hammond. We left after church one day, went down to see him. And surprisingly, there was nobody in the room besides him. And he was sleeping. And I said, oh, good. So I went in, and Brenda and I went in, and we looked. I said, oh, he's sleeping, Brenda. And he turned, pulled his head up, and he looked over at me. And I went, oh, no. We sat down and chatted for a while. Because Brenda, before that, Brenda said, let's go down and talk to him about Jesus. Well, you know, you get a little apprehensible. Uh, even me, I, it gets a little scary. So we sat down and talked for a while. And a little while, Brenda says, you know, bless her heart. Brenda says, you want me to shut the door? I said, no, don't shut the door. Because there were nurses out there milling about and so forth. I didn't have my Bible with me. And I finally just said, we'd like to talk to you about heaven. Would you mind? No. Start. He says, but you know what? I don't believe that. If you believe there's a heaven, that's fine. I don't know if there's a heaven or not. This is where you have to learn your scriptures. That's why I praise you folks for learning the passages of scriptures. You memorize each Sunday night. I says, well, the book of Titus says in chapter 3 that God does not lie. So my Bible tells me that God does not lie. I said, do you believe that? He said, yeah. I said, okay, then. Well, then the book of John, chapter 14, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He says, Jesus says, I go to prepare a mansion for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And where I go, there ye may be also. If it were not so, I would have told you. I said, you, I said, do you understand that Jesus is talking about heaven here? And he's telling his, I said, he's telling his disciples that <clears throat> there's a heaven. And when he goes from this earth, he's going to that heaven and he's preparing a mansion. I said, do you understand that what he's talking about here is that in heaven, he's preparing a place for you. And I said, you know, he's been preparing that place for over 2,000 years. I said, you understand that this earth is all you have right now? I said, if you were to pass from this earth, you have nothing else but a Christless eternity. And I told him about Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, whoremongers and so forth in the lake of fire. And all liars. And I said, do you realize that even if you tell a fib, that's a lie? Well, yeah. To make a long story short, he bowed his head and asked the Lord Jesus Christ into his heart. And I don't take credit for that. I give all the credit in the world to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God for the, giving me the power and the ability through him to do that. Amen. We have, to, we have to continue to seize the opportunity as Christians and awake out of sleep, my friends. And he said afterwards, he said, that is the most important decision in my life that I have ever made. He's some 70 years old. I said, yes, it is. And I explained to him, do you do understand that it's not the prayer that's going to get you into heaven, but believing everything that I had told you previous to the prayer is going to get you into heaven. I said, the prayer is just verifying to God what you believe I told you. He says, yes, I understood all that. Oh, I thank the Lord for that. Amen. 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 You see, we have this power in earth and vessels, the Bible says. Do you understand that we have hold the power? We hold the dynamite. We are the casing to the dynamite or the deutimo or the gospel. And we hold that, and we can share that with others and see them come to know Christ as their Savior. But the Bible says we have to awake out of sleep. Number two, we need to see others. We must cast off. Number one, we have to wake up. Number two, we have to cast off. Look at verse 12. Bible says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, Let's put on the armor of light. If we are not careful, 
We will let the sins of this world control us. I work in, well, we all work and live in a sinful place. It's just the way it is. But sometimes if you let it, it can overbear, it can be overbearing and you can let it control you. We have to be able to not let situations in so forth control us. We cannot get comfortable in our surroundings, my friends. Because we have to put on what? The whole armor of God. Why? Because we're in a battle. We're soldiers. And we're fighting what? The good fight of faith, the Bible says. So we're soldiers. We're supposed to be soldiers out there fighting the good fight of faith. And if we let ourselves be succumb to uh, the world, then we're no use to God. You know, if the salt has lost its savor... It is no use. So if we lose our saltiness, what good are we to God? God doesn't want that. Have you ever eaten salt? And I love salt, probably more than I should. But when salt gets old, you have to use more and more and more of it to get the same effect. Pretty soon you just got to throw the salt out and get new salt. I do anyway. That's the way we can become. Over time, if we just let the world beat us and beat us and beat us and beat us down, we become like that salt. We just kind of lose our savor. And we we lose our saltiness. You know, a a light that's hit under a bushel is useless. You can't see the light if it's hit under the bushel, right? That's what the Bible says. But a light that's set on a hill is bright. When we lived in North Carolina, we went to Linville Falls, and Linville Falls had a cavern. And we went down into this cavern, had a great time down in there, and then they shut the lights out. We couldn't, you could hold your hand like just in front of your face, and you couldn't see it. You could not see your hand this close, because I tried it. That's how dark it was. That's actually another description of hell, outer darkness. Or the worm dieth not. And then the guy that was our guide, I could hear him fumbling around and he took a match. And now we're in this huge cavern, it's bigger than this room, and I can't see I can't see this. He takes a match and hold, and lights the match and it lit up that whole cavern. I mean, it, there was a glow in that whole cavern. You could see every individual. You could see all the rocks. You could see everything from one little match. Do you understand, friends, that we are that one little match? Amen. We are the one little match in a sinful world. And if we cover our light or our bushel, then we're no good. People can't see us. And people need to see us. People need to know who we are. Jesus said, and what? I am the light of the world, amen. And John, in me is no darkness. The Bible says, hide not your light under a bushel, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. I'm afraid that many of our lights are getting dim. To see others, we must... Number three, walk honestly. Walk honestly. Look at verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Rioting here means a violent disturbance of the peace. We're not very Christian-like if we are creating a riot or we're disturbing the peace. Drunkenness plainly means being intoxicated. We're no good to God if we're intoxicated. I mean, do not touch the unclean thing. It means everything. I know I was a drunk. And I know how I was when I was a drunk. 
there were nights that I don't even remember coming home. There were nights I, I, woke, I woke up one time on my mother's kitchen table. I, it's kind of silly now, but I, I drove 25 or 30 better miles from wherever I was to home, and I, I woke up on my mother. Drunkenness, my friends, you're not in your right mind. Chambering, sexually immoral, immortality or lewdness. Wantonness, one given to self-indulgence, flirtation, a lewd person. Strife, angry or bitter to cause discord. Envy, discontented with what you have, wanting and always wanting what others have. Those are all descriptions of what we are not supposed to be, my friends. Right. And if the world can, can't see us because they see this, then what good are we? And that's why the warning is, let us walk honestly in the day, not in rioting and in drunkenness, not in chambering and in wantingness, not in strife and in envy. But we cannot do it alone Praise the Lord for verse number 14. Because look what it says. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I can do, th I can do all things through Christ. who? Christ. Amen. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I am nothing. But with God I am something. I praise the Lord for my God. You know, he looked down on me, a sinner, a drunk. I wasn't worth anything, but he loved me. Amen. God loved me, and God loved you. God looked through all of your sin, all of your strife, all of your terribleness, all of your wickedness, and there was a love there. A love that we cannot fathom or comprehend, but a love that we can try to work out through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it's only by putting on the Lord Jesus Christ that we will make no provision for the flesh. No provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. There's lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And the devil tries to get it through us all, all of us that way. The eye gate, the ear gate, what we see, what we hear. My friends, we have to be careful, especially in this day and age. The greatest act of love was the act of love that God himself gave. John 3.16 For God so loved. For God so loved. My friends, we need to so love. Amen. We need to so love others as God loves others. We need to see others as God sees others. But it's a battle. Because as the brother said this morning, there's a devil fighting us. And he cannot take us to hell if we're saved, but he can ruin our testimonies. He can't take us to hell but he can quiet us down. Yep. It is so hard to walk in the world these days and try to be a Christian, amen. That's why the Bible says, iron, ver iron sharpeneth iron. That means when we come together, the book of Proverbs, iron sharpeneth iron, that means that when we come together, we are sharpening ourselves. We are, we are getting together and building each other up Amen. and strengthening each other, and we need that. Hallelujah. In prayer, 
and in friendship and in love. God's love operates irrespective of human merit. Meaning that God's love operates above and beyond what human merit sees or believes. God's love covers all of that. Because the Bible said, for God so loved. He loved me, and he loved you, and he loves you that are in here. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he loves you. And you say, how can he love somebody because I have done this, or I have done that, or I have done this? Hey, there was the maniac of Kedera, the Bible said, and he was a wicked person. God loved him. And within a split second, that maniac that was running around in the tombs, cutting himself and being, a, and being an evil person, was sitting down at dinner in a right mind, eating and clothed, because God loved him. Amen. And he asked the Christ for forgiveness. And Jesus says, if you believe on me, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We love others who love us, but God's love goes beyond that. Do you understand that? Oh, we'll love someone and like someone if they like us or love us. But if they do something to harm us or hurt us, oh, oh I hate that person. You ever feel that way? Come on, I do at times. Unfortunately, I do, and I say, Lord, forgive me. I'm not standing up here being a righteous person, okay? I'm just telling it like it is. Right. I, I, I beat myself up so much because I want to see people and I want to be in situations as God would be in, but I, but I fail miserably. But you know what? We have a loving God who, who, says, who says, you know what? I'm just going to pick you up and wipe you off because you understand each and every one of you and you had a parent in here or has parents or have had parents, that they loved you. They loved you beyond love, in a sense. Because when you messed up, they thought, oh man, my parents are going to hate me for this. They aren't going to love me anymore. You know, they loved you. They had to discipline you, but they loved you, amen. They never, they never cast you out and said, we don't love you anymore, leave. God's love goes beyond that. God does not love us for what we have or what we have not done. God loves us unconditionally for God so loved. God's love does not depend on who or what we are for God so loved. We don't have to qualify for God's love for God so loved. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. For God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ God commended his love toward us. Or he went above and beyond. <clears throat> God exhibited his love to us. He declared his love to us, and he confirmed his love for us when he commended his love to us. For God so loved. He confirmed it. He commended, meaning that God confirmed his love for you and for me when Jesus went to the cross. When Jesus hung on that cross and he said, it is finished, God commanded his love for you. For God so loved you and me. That's the love of God. I can't comprehend that. I can't, I can't, I can't understand that. I couldn't, if we, 
probably the closest maybe we could get to this is brothers in arms fighting in battle with each other. And these men would die for each other. Okay, that's about probably as close as I can fathom this type of, of situation. And I'm not sure that that is love more than, than um, um, I don't know, duty in a sense. But God's love goes beyond that. God's love has no boundaries. God's love sets no limitations. God's love demands nothing in return. But don't we at times? Be honest. We love someone. But do we love them enough to not demand anything of them? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says all have sinned, but God so loved. By sin, by de- I can't hear, uh, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Why? Because God so loved. The wages of sin, the wages of our sin is death. We're going to die anyway, but we're going to die a second death if you don't know Christ is your personal Savior. Amen. But through God's love, he get, overcame that, and Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he said, it is finished. And when he said, it is finished, the veil was rent, meaning that there was no more, no more works, no more deeds you had to do. You didn't have to do anything. Jesus said it is finished, finished, and the veil was rent from top to bottom. Why? Showing that God did it, not man. And the veil was this thick. It wasn't just some frilly little blanket that you would think. It was thick, woven piece of material. And God rent that veil for you and for me, and the earth shook for you and for me. And Jesus gave himself for you and for me because he didn't have to. Jesus finally said he bare that cross. In his old body, he bare that cross. Carried it. Carried that sin and your sin and my sin. And carried the mechanism that was going to take his life to Golgotha. And... Let them hang them there for you and for me. For God so loved. You know, not some time ago I was preaching somewhere, and I share this because I'm worried about the love of God. You know, I praise the Lord for our pastor. I praise the Lord for our pastor and his church and the love of God that is shown in, 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 in the things that are going on in, in everyone here because not every place is like that. I went in to preach and the folks come in and they sat down and they had a special song and it was kind of nightclub music and I said, oh boy. And I'd been here a number of times. This was a good, this was a good fundamental Bible believing Baptist church. We bore through that. I got up to preach and I preached. And I went, we were finished and I went to the back. And a lady came up to me. She says, bless your heart. She said, I come in this morning. She said, I prayed for something out of the Word of God. She says, you know what? You preach the King James Bible. She said, you preached to me. She said, I got something from the Word of God today. She says, I don't get that. Friends, there's there's churches out there and pastor has said it, and everyone has said it. There's churches out there falling daily and weekly because I think, in most part, they've lost the love. Yeah. 
they've lost the love. This was morning service, and I went back in the evening service, and there was only a handful of folks. And one of the gentlemen gets a lectern out for me to, like we have for Sunday school, and I go to preach from that <clears throat> because there's only a handful, and he gets me a chair to sit on. <laughs> I said, I, I, I'm not going to sit on that chair. Well, you can if you want to. I said, well, I don't want to. <laughs> you know, I, I pray for that church. I'm not making fun of it. It, it, uh, it, uh, it saddens me. They've lost a love, my friends. Sunday school. It was 15 or 20 minutes. We had coffee, donuts, chatting. Finally, I had to open up the Bible and start Sunday school. I said, hey, let, let's start Sunday school. Let's have a Bible. Let's have a lesson. I, I, I don't know. what. I don't know. But it saddens me, friends. They lost their love. This message tonight is is preached primarily to, to put off the works of darkness, folks. Amen. Don't let the, let's not let the devil creep in. Amen. He does it ever so slowly in many different ways. Yep. He knows how to twist the keys. He knows what buttons to pull. Let's be careful. Let's put off the works of darkness, the Bible says. Let's put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh. Put on the armor to what? Fight the fiery darts, to ward off the fiery darts. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, as we come to you in prayer this night, we ask that there be someone here that does not know Christ as our personal Savior, that tonight would be the night that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Lord, for us Christians here tonight, we ask that you strengthen us and continue to walk with us and guide us. Help us, help us, help us to continue to focus on you. Lord, guide us and direct us. Lord, we, we thank you for this ministry. We thank you for our pastor, Melva, and our deacons and our Sunday school teachers. And all those involved in this ministry that still stick for the stuff, Lord, we pray for them and thank you for them. We thank you for them for standing on the front lines and battling every day. Thank you for all of the ministries here and all of the teachers and all of those workers involved in all of the ministries. We thank you for this church and what it stands for. We thank you that God so loved us, Lord. We thank you that you so loved us that you gave that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life, we thank you. Lord, we give this service over to you. And Lord, we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand and turn to 543. 543. Out my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into thy freedom, gladness, and life. Jesus, I come to thee, out of my sickness into thy hell, out of my want and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shame 
woeful failure and loss. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come into the glorious gain of thy cross. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of her sorrows into thy bone, out of life's storms and into thy calm, out of distress to jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee. unrest and arrogant pride. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of myself to dwell in thy love, out of despair into rapture above, upward for I on wings like a dove, Jesus I come. I come to thee. If you look under that in the little words, it says, Christ hath made us free, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5 1. Amen. 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 Why? Because Jesus loves. <laughs> Amen. No longer are we tangled or need to be entangled with the yoke of bondage. What did Jesus say? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, what he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. The book of Matthew. Take Jesus' yoke. What that means is Jesus is in that yoke with you. A yoke of oxen, a team of horses, and they're hooked in a yoke. But Jesus has got the yoke. And he has you going to keep you. And he's right beside you. He says, what, well, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise. And that's also eternal security. Amen. Amen. If we're saved, Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's eternal security and that's a promise from God. Let's believe that. Let's trust in that. Mark, would you pray? Thank you, Father God, for this unspeakable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation through his name. Forgive us for our complacency, Lord. We have the most wonderful gift and the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Father God, if we're right with you, help us to stay right with you, to be right with you, to put off the works of this flesh, Lord. It attacks us all day in and day out, Father God. We have our moments. Lord, but we can always come to you and ask for forgiveness. And it amazes me, Father God, that even in the midst of our sin, we come to you and confess it, realizing that we've sinned against the Holy God. And 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 because we're Christians, we just know that, you know, we're wrong and we confess it. And then it's amazing, Lord, the next minute you can use us to witness to someone. That's the power of God, Lord. It's not of us, Father God. So, Lord, help us to walk out of here uh, strengthened with might in the inner man that we might take a glorious gospel to a lost and dying world. And we'll praise you and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's close with one verse of 390. 390.